welcome everybody to It's Not All in the Genes, Sperm and Egg Dome's Feelings of Connection with Their Recipients, which is part of Manchester's Festival of Social Science. We are going to present and discuss recent findings from a sociological study into what it's like to be an egg or sperm donor. And in doing so, we're going to focus in particular on donor sense of connections with their recipients. I'm Dr. Petra Nordqvist from the University of Manchester, and I'm both the chair and the first speaker at this event. Um, our second speaker tonight is Dr. Leah Gilman, also from the University of Manchester, and she will focus on the findings from the project, the research project. Our third and final speaker is Yael Elan Clark, from, who is a research coordinator at the Donor Conception Network, and she will respond to our presentations. After that, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Okay, so let me share. So I shall put on my hat of actually presenting tonight. And let, so let me please share my other slides, which uh, I hope you can all see now. Um, so uh, the, the project that we are, that this tonight is based on is an, it's a project that started in 2017, which is about being an egg or sperm donor. And it's a sociological research project into these issues. Um, it's called the Curious Connections Project. It explores the impact of being an egg and sperm donor on donors' own lives and relationships. And it investigates this experience from the point of view of sperm and egg donors, of course, also infertility counsellors, donor coordinators, donors' kin, such as partners, parents and their siblings. And also we've researched the UK policy context. Um, so it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. It started in January 2017 and um, I'm, the, I'm leading on this project. Also Leah Gilman, uh, Luciana Lang, Christine Turner and Hazel Burke is in the project team. And the project is just in its final stages now and will soon be coming to an end. Um, so why then should we study egg and sperm donors? Well, the UK and the global fertility industry is absolutely reliant on men and women agreeing to donate egg and sperm for the purpose of donor conception. In the UK, 58,000 babies were born using donated egg and sperm within UK clinics between 1992 and 2016. And that's the last figures that we have from the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. So, as I said, donors are, are obviously really central to this development and this form of fertility treatment, but we know very little to date about donors themselves as people in their own right. We know, and in particular, we know very little about how being a donor impacts on donors' own everyday lives and our everyday relationships. We also know very little about how this compares for different kinds of donors, for male and female donors, for identity release donors and for known donors. Um, so we have an interest in all of these issues. So why is it then important to understand more about donors as people with lives and relationships of their own? Well, I was part of a, of a research project a few years ago called Relative Strangers, where we looked into how being a recipient parent of donor-conceived children uh, impacted on, on parents as well as grandparents' family relationships. And what we found in this study was that using donor conception wasn't just an issue for the couple, the, the parent who decided to do so, but the impact of donor conception could really trickle through whole family networks and an impact on family relationships and ways of relating in families in all sorts of ways. And so, and, and uh, in all sorts of ways, including, for example, giving rise to sensitivities and secrecy. So the issue then emerged, or the question emerged, for me anyway, uh, that if, if receiving stranger genes into the family might have this kind of impact on family relationships, and what is it like when people decide to give away egg and sperm to other people, to people they might know or to people they don't know? Uh, so we, starting this project, we know, we, we thought we knew anyway that donation would impact on family relationships in some way, but we didn't know how it would impact. Um, the, the reason why we're studying this now is because donor conception in the UK is, is at a really interesting point, and that's partly because it's changed a lot and the policy around it has changed a lot in recent years. Before 1991, when it was entirely unregulated and it became regulated and, and what it meant to be a donor became regulated in 1991. And between 1991 and March 2005, donors in the UK were completely anonymous, which meant that they were not traceable 
by either the recipient or the donor conceived person. But the, the sentiment around what it meant to be a donor and what was important to consider in being a donor started to shift in the late 1990s and early 2000s and brought around a, pol a change, a, a sort of a, a big change in policy which came into force on the 1st of April 2005, which meant that donors were no longer completely anonymous. And instead, a policy that we, th we now know as identity release was introduced, which meant that donors nowadays are traceable and contactable when the donor conceived child turns 18. And this first cohort that will do so turn 18 in 2023. So we're, ve we're now very near a very interesting a, a date that I think many in this room, in this virtual room, we were very interested in and we we're kind of watching this space. Uh, so, so that means that donation has, has shifted a lot and changed a lot and that donors maybe used to be able to go home and forget about having been a donor, whereas now identity release donors have to consider the impact of having, having been a donor and also the, the, the potential that someone will one day turn up and want contact of some form which also means that perhaps they need to embed that knowledge within their own relationships and everyday lives. Um, it's important then to bear in mind or to look at what, what this policy means from the point of view of donors, but as we do so to also understand that there are different kinds of donors and in fact being a donor is a really varied experience. So we have on the one hand identity release donors who are not, in, so they donate via clinics, uh, usually as altruistic donors. Uh, they are not entitled to any identifying information about their recipients or children born from their donations ever. Uh, however, they can find out a, a, a limited amount of, of information about them, which is the number of children born from their donation, the year of birth and their sex. Now, recipients, on the other hand, can request some non-identifying information about donors, but donors cannot do so in return. Um, the other group of donors uh, that we have also included and looked at uh, quite a lot in this project are known donors. And known donors are people who donate, they might donate to family members, uh, to friends or to relative strangers met for this purpose alone, for example, via social media or online platforms. Uh, they might meet uh, their recipients on matching websites or social media and this is a practice that is really growing and has grown over, over the last few years. These donors then and their donation and, and the families born in this way operate, so to speak, outside the system and so doesn't follow the same regulations. And it's really, really important to know just how varied this group of donors is. On, on the one hand, we've got people who donate to family members or to close friends and so on. But on the other hand, we have people who donate to people they meet online only for the purpose of donation, and they may well keep, decide to keep themselves very anonymous within that meeting. So this is a really varied group, uh, even though we, we for, the, for the purpose of this presentation, we talk of them as, as known donors. Um, in this project then, just before I tell you a little bit about what we've done, the methods, and before I, I um, introduce Leah to you, is to say that our sociological approach here in this project is to focus on donors lives as relational and embedded which means to say that we see donors as people that come with their own connection they come with partners children parents aunts obvious this is all obvious uh, but a lot of the policy to date seem to sort of assume that donors operate almost like an island an island of their own without these connections whereas the focus of this project is to see them very much as relational and embedded um, we also use a qualitative um, methodology which means that we look for in-depth data rather than quantitative broad data so to tell you very quickly about what, we've, what we have done, um, we have consulted policy documents, we've interviewed uh, a lot of people, including donors, counsellors, uh, donor coordinators in clinics and also donors relatives. And uh, my final slide today, apologies because it's a very busy one, but this is just to show you something about just what a varied group of donors uh, that we have in the study. So if you look to the very left of this slide, uh, the blue steeple here is all the donors and then the orange are sperm donors and the gray one are egg, egg and embryo donors. We have one 
participants who have donated embryos. Um, so if you look to the very left here, the donation pathways, is that most of our donors took part in, in identity, sorry, yeah, as identity release altruistic donors within clinics. But we also have quite a, a sizable proportion of known donors within the study. Then we have the egg share donors, which is a particular group of egg donors who donate um, in return for, for lower price IVF for themselves. So these are women who themselves are in the process of, of accessing IVF for fertility treatment, fertility treatment and agree to be donors as part of that process. Um, there is also an, an interesting distinction between whether donors donate via clinics or out of clinics. Uh, some, for example, known egg donors have to go via clinics, whereas sperm donation doesn't necessarily have to happen via clinics. So as you can see, the majority of our participants did go via clinics, but we also had uh, people who donated outside of the clinic framework. Then finally on the right, you can see the varied ways in which people are matched with their recipients. The clinic do most of the matching in our study, but we also have people using personal networks, online matching, and also even agencies. So this is just to give you a really broad understanding of just what a varied group we're talking about here and the, the many very different pathways through which donors become donors and act as donors. So with that, I want to hand over to Dr. Leah Gilman, who will introduce some of the findings that we have in the study. Hi, everyone. Right, I'll just get my slides up. Uh, am I right in thinking you can see the slides there, Petra? Brilliant. OK, so um, in this section of the presentation, I am going to be talking about the, the findings from our research. Um, and specifically, I'm going to focus on three case studies, which I think tell us something interesting about how the donors we interviewed thought about or related to their recipients. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss some of our ideas about what we think in terms of uh, socially and culturally what's going on, what we think maybe shapes um, the donors' experiences in this, um, in this respect. Um, and then at the end of our presentation, with the view to kind of generating a bit of discussion and getting everyone thinking, I'm going to outline some possible changes to policies around donor conception, which would potentially address our findings. And that's very much, uh, the, the, very much the idea of that is to kind of get a bit of discussion going and get, get people thinking about what the implications of these findings might be. And then at the very end of the event, not part of my presentation, but after we've all had a chance to talk and ask questions, I'm going to be coming back to you about those suggestions um, and getting you, asking you to vote anonymously on which, if any, if any of those suggestions you think would actually be a good idea or not. So we'll see what everyone has to say at the end. Um, so to begin, I just want you to kind of imagine that you've got a, a friend of yours, maybe a family member, has just told you that they're thinking that they're going to become a sperm or egg donor, or maybe they've told you that you ha they have been a sperm or egg donor. How might you react to them? Um, what do you think you might say to them? Now, I realise that I'm talking to a group of people here that have a very sort of special, often some of you will have a very specialised interest in this from, from whatever angle. Uh, but what we found when we spoke to the donors we interviewed about their friends and their family members' reactions, uh, we found that they often said things like, um, oh, oh, does that mean that you're kind of a dad now? Um, I think you can see that on the screen, hang on. Um, or they'd say, oh, wow, I, I couldn't do that I mean it's amazing but you know I'd always feel like there was a child out there that was the word that kind of sometimes came up uh, now aside from the kind of vocabulary with words like that and certainly people in this audience will find those kind of words problematic and a lot of the donors we interviewed sometimes found those words problematic too but more than that what we found was that these kind of reactions were often just kind of out of step with what donors saw as maybe the key relationships and connections which donation created, because these reactions all very much emphasise the genetic relation that might, relationship that might potentially be created between a donor and someone who might be born from their donation. But actually, for many of the donors we interviewed, not all, but many, uh, the key connection involved or created through donation was with their recipients. 
Um, and interestingly, this was often the case even for those who had never met their recipients um, and didn't know who they were at all. But it was still the recipient sometimes that was the person that kind of most or they most of thought about when they thought about the donation or the person they wanted to know more about or they wanted to meet one day. Um, so we had quite a lot of statements like this um, from Rachel. She says, uh, the connection that I feel the most is with the mother and I'd love to meet her one day. Um, and Louis, who, these are all pseudonyms, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, Louis was um, somebody interviewed, um, who is an identity to release sperm donor. And we were talking about, oh, you know, how often do you even really think about being a donor? Is this something you think about often? And he didn't say it was something that came up very often in his head, but he said, when it did, it's not even about the child, really. I hope that it's the fact that I hope that the parents or the parent, maybe, who opted to go down this route are as fulfilled as they hope to be and as happy as they hope to be. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus now on three particular case studies, which I think show a bit in a bit more detail, uh, bring out a bit more detail about how donors experience these connections with recipients. But before I do that, I just want to have a look, say a little caveat, which is that I don't want to kind of give the impression that the donors that we interviewed didn't care about or have any thoughts about the children that would be conceived from the donation. They certainly did. Um, and that and that could be a whole other presentation that I don't have time to do today. But I guess what we're wanting to show in the pre this presentation is to say that often the kind of emotional weight that was attached to connections arising from donation was kind of oriented towards recipients and we also just want we we're highlighting this particular connection because we think it's one that was often overlooked by the people that donors spoke to in their everyday lives and i think perhaps it's also one that we tend to overlook when we just think about um in the world of donor conception more widely and policies around it so our first case study is rachel um, Rachel donated eggs as part of an egg sharing programme, so Petra mentioned that earlier, so egg sharing is where um, a woman who's having her own IVF treatment agrees to donate half their eggs and in exchange they receive reduced cost treatment for themselves. So at the time that she, that she became a donor, she was married, um, she had a young son, but she'd been struggling for a long time to conceive a second child. Um, after several miscarriages and the limited treatment that you can access on the NHS, um, they started to look at IVF in private clinics, uh, which is where they first came across the possibility of egg sharing. Um, and Rachel emphasised that, of course, you know, the money saved was a factor, but she really felt that wasn't the driver. She actually mentioned that her parents got to pay anyway, so it wasn't really a financial thing. It was just something that her and her husband felt really driven towards doing. Um, now, Rachel's recipient had written her a letter at the time of the donation, at the end of the donation, thanking her for what she had done, um, explaining a little bit about herself and why they'd chosen Rachel from her profile. And it also contained a gift of a necklace. Um, and this, this meant a lot to Rachel. She actually kind of cried remembering this letter that, that the, this woman had written to her. And she talked about really wanting to write a response, although she hadn't actually done it at the time of the interview. Um, and this is what she said during her interview. She said, and the letter was just wonderful. If the house was on fire is something I would try and take because it's something that when my son is older, I'd like to share with him. And she sent me that necklace and I wore the necklace when I had my son. So, you know, when she was giving birth, because I just, I would like to meet her. That's why I said I'd like to meet her the more than the baby. I just feel this really strong. I guess it's like I have an affinity to her, that we have an understanding perhaps of the journey we've been on. It's the kind of thing where I think, well, maybe we'll be in our 50s and we'll sit around and have a coffee and she can tell me about the things that I've wondered about over the years. And maybe she's wondered similar things about it too. And there was, there was a later part of her interview where she talked about this situation she was in where she felt like she might not, um, it seemed like she wasn't going to produce enough eggs and she might not have enough eggs to egg share because if you, you needed to produce eight and if she wasn't going to produce eight eggs, then she was going to have to make a decision whether to um, donate all of her eggs and that would probably would mean that she would need to have another cycle for her own treatment or if she was going to keep all the eggs, which would mean paying the extra for the extra cost of the cycle and also obviously that her recipient wouldn't receive anything and she just she was talking about that situation she said i remember leaving the clinic and i was in tears before i even left the building i was crying so much a stranger on the streets got me and asked me if i was okay but the thing i really felt was and there was never any question if it hadn't worked if i hadn't got the eight chair i would have given them all to her 
I just felt there was absolutely no way I could do that cycle and then go, I'm going to keep all the eggs for myself. I just couldn't because as soon as I signed on the line to say that we were going to do the egg sharing, I can't describe it. For me, it was just like this inexplicable bond to this person. I've got no idea who they are, where they are, but so I was so devastated because I knew that if it happened, I was going to have to do it all again for myself. And it's just so hideous that I didn't want to do it all again. And I think I felt like I'd let her down because she had been told, well, this lady's going to have a lot of eggs and you can share these eggs. And I gave her five. And I know it doesn't really matter because you just need one. But I think I felt like I'd let her down. Not disappointed, I was letting her down. So what really struck me when I was listening and reading about Rachel's account afterwards was the real emotional power of this feeling of affinity she had with the woman she had never met. Um, this came through in other interviews as well, we found, but I think in her interviews protect, expressed particularly clearly and strongly. Um, and there's also that really strong sense of commitment she feels with her and the way that she enacts that connection through her own family relationships. So wearing the necklace when she gave birth, um, keeping that letter as a treasured item, especially to show her, her son um, who was born from that cycle. Um, our second case study is a woman that we've called Abby. Um, Abby has donated eggs multiple times and each time she's donated to a different couple. The first time she donated was to an, 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 a couple, she, an anonymous couple to her, so she was an identity release donor. Um, but after that first donation, she donated several more times and after that it was always someone she knew. So I'm going to read an extract from her interview where she explains what was good but also challenging about donating to someone she knew on that second cycle. Um, so in this case, she's donated to someone she's kind of got to know through somebody else. And but we described a bit of a kind of instant hitting it off with that person as soon as they met. Um, and she said, and that was really lovely. It was so different knowing the couple. I think at the end of donating to the anonymous couple, once the eggs were taken out and there was, and I was so excited to know the next steps, but really there are no next steps as a donor. That's it. You just come to a full stop. And although you know this journey is just at the beginning for them, it's, you feel really severed from the rest of the process, which I do understand, but I was like, oh, I really wanted to know how the story progressed. So donating to a known couple was a bit like the next step, really. But then the downside to donating to a known couple is you're so emotionally invested in it working for them. So that we had a cycle and they had a good collection of eggs, but they had to have eggs the last minute and they ended up with maybe two or three embryos. And because of Jane's, the sneaking and we've given her recipient Jane's age, they put them all back in together. Um, and the night before we went for dinner, and I think they just really wanted to thank me for what I've done before they told me it hadn't worked. I mean, Jane said she felt in her heart she knew she wasn't pregnant. And I was, I just felt like the rescuer. I was like, well, we'll just do it again. We'll just do another cycle. It's fine and so desperate for them. But yeah, she said she couldn't go through the IVF again. And she goes on. But interestingly with Jane, I mean, we talked a lot about what it would have been like if I donated to them. And she, she made it quite clear if there was a baby from the donation, she would have to not have contact with me. And I knew at that point that if I was going to donate to known couples, then I would just have to accept whatever status they put on the relationship. Jane knew herself and she was like, if there's a child out there, it would just stress me out for us to be hanging out. And I was like, that's fine. I'll completely respect whatever donation direction you want to go in with this. And I felt a bit sad about it, not because of the child, but because I like Jane so much. And then it didn't work for them. And I was just quite heartbroken for them, really. So in Abby's count, there's that real sense of kind of going on the journey with her recipients this time because she knows them and she's in contact with them and she's very much part of that journey. And that's kind of, there's a sense there that's, that's really rewarding and um, deeply felt for her being valued, being included in that process. But at the same time, we do get a sense of kind of how intense that is as well, both when it doesn't work, which which she kind of feels the loads of that with them, but also that sense that, well, if it had worked, actually, that might have been a quite complicated and intense relationship that that might needed to have been managed, particularly from the recipient's perspective as well. So you get a little bit of a sense of the complexity of this relationship through Abby's story. And then our final case study is Ian. Um, uh, so this is a slightly different story. Ian was a known sperm donor and he'd first donated at university uh, when a couple of friends asked him, a lesbian couple, if he would donate to them. 
And then years later, after, uh, after that donation, he looked into the possibility of donating to others via online platforms that, that uh, Petra mentioned before. And he's donated to multiple couples from women this way, mostly women in same-sex relationships. And about 30 children have been born as a result of his donations. So he explained that being a donor had given him this really unique and kind of privileged, he did emphasise the kind of privileged insight into other people's lives. And he really valued that he'd been able to meet people and help people from all different walks of life. And he highlighted that through being a donor, he 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 was kind of let into a really intimate part of people's lives. And he was bound up with those big decisions and changes in terms of having a family, becoming parents. And he found that really fascinating and rewarding. And he talked in particular about one lesbian couple who, even though he really didn't them at all um he, he felt very close to them um and i asked him you know is there anything else that's really comparable to this relationship that you have with these recipients or indeed your other any of the other recipients and and he said no no because there's almost like zero boundaries you know i can talk to them about all sorts of stuff so i'm like in their family but i'm not in their family and it's really weird it is unique and he went on to say one couple have actually written back to me and said, we love you dearly and we love you more than anything in the world because you've given us this gift. I'm actually regarded as a very important person in their life, even though we don't speak to each other. They've got me in this little bubble somewhere in their mind. Being a donor gives you a path to a very intimate part of their family without actually having to be part of their family. So with Ian, there's again, again, there's a real sense of a kind of ongoing bond with this recipient, even though they don't have any contact. And it seems to be bound up with, significant, with his knowledge of the significance of the gift that he's given and therefore this kind of unique liminal uh, relationship he has to their family. So in our book, we use the, the concept of affinity as used by Jennifer Mason to think about the character of these connections, which donors describe with their recipients or some, some donors describe with their recipients. Um, so Mason describes affinities as potent connections in everyday life. They are encounters where it's possible to identify a spark or a charge of connection that makes personal life charismatic or entrants or even toxifies us. And we thought this was a kind of a fitting way to think about how our donors were describing their relationship to recipients not just because it is a word that Rachel actually uses in her interview, but also that idea of a spark or charge seemed to really chime with the, the way donors were describing um, these connections. I think it's there when Rachel talks about wearing the necklace from her recipient when she gives birth, um, the strength of her feelings and commitment on signing that form. It's there when Abby talks about just kind of hitting it off with Jane and Ian talk of being put in a bubble. Um, and what's kind of nice about um, Mason concept really is that she says that affinities can be experienced as kind of enchanting and charismatic but they can also be experienced as um, um, oppressive or even toxic and you and you kind of get a sense of that in Abby's story to some extent because you get the sense that you can imagine how this kind of sense of affinity but could become overwhelming or, or difficult in some way. So I'm not going to attempt to try and offer a complete theory about kind of where these senses of affinity come from or why, but I just want to explore a little bit how cultures and practices around donation and donor conception might kind of contribute to the feeling that of these connections being charged and also to think about how they might contribute to people, whether people experience them as positive and affirming or intense or overwhelming. Um, and in relation to that, I guess we're also going to think a little bit about how um, why it is that these experiences of affinity were more often articulated by some donors than others. So you may have noticed that there's a bit of a bias in what we've shared so far towards egg donor stories. Um, and that reflects the fact that if we just look at clinic donors, we find that we do find these kind of strong narratives of affinity are more common amongst clinic egg donors than clinic sperm donors. But we also find them in the kind of uh, group of donors which, which Ian belongs to of um, known donors who donate outside, outside of clinics as well. So the first thing that I really want to talk about if we're thinking about kind of cultures and practices around donor conception um, is the way that 
sperm and egg flation is often talked about as a gift. Um, this happened very much in clinics. Um, it happened in the online groups for, don for donors and recipients, and it happens in the stories and the accounts of donors themselves, as you saw, it's particularly prominent in Ian's account. Now, the social relationships that are bound up with giving are kind of a bit ambivalent um, in Western societies. On the one hand, there's this kind of idea that if you're going to be good at giving a gift, then you've got to completely give up any connection to that. Um, uh, and many donors kind of articulated that by saying, well, if it's a gift, you need to just completely let go. But on the other hand, there's this idea that gifts kind of express relationships or that they create relationships. And that would be by giving, we create social obligation on the recipient, it reciprocates. And in this way, you kind of create ongoing ties. Um, this is what the anthropologist Marcel Morse re refers to as a gift relationship. And if you look at researchers who studied other kinds of body donation, I'm thinking of organ and bone marrow donation, for example, um, these researchers have sometimes used this idea of a gift relationship to try to explain well why is it that people who give or receive other kinds of bodily tissues also sometimes experience these kinds of social ties and connection and if we look at the kind of policies around organ donation or bone marrow donation for example organizations that sort of, um, facilitate these things often acknowledge these kind of sense of connection by enabling communication between and contact by by mutual consent between recipients and donors. Um, and something else which I personally think is really interesting and important um, is the interplay between secrecy and disclosure in the world of donor conception. So a, a lot of you, and as Petra always talked about, um, a lot of you already know there's been big changes in the last two decades or so, and there's now a very strong emphasis on openness being the best way to approach this. So that, that, that's true, but we also need to acknowledge that there's still a lot which is hidden and kept secret between donor and recipient families um, uh, if, they, if they go down the identity release route. And I'm thinking from the donor's perspective, an egg donor, for example, is often very aware that um, the, their recipient has been anonymously matched to them and might be in the waiting room right after them or might have just left the clinic before them. And I think the knowledge of that secrecy and the knowledge that revelation is possible and may happen in the future can actually be really compelling and really enigmatic for donors. Um, and the anonymity of that clinic matching also makes any coincidences really compelling. So, for example, Rachel told me that um, she had discovered through that letter from her recipient that her recipient was a particular nationality and then she actually had a grandmother who's this nationality as well and thought you know and she just really thought it was really interesting and um, really compelling that this coincidence that they, that they didn't know this about she didn't know this but she picked Rachel anyway and there was this coincidence. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is the actual material process of donating and transferring gametes, um, transferring egg sperm, and how this might give rise to, or perhaps in some ways inhibit feelings of affinity between um, donors and recipients. So obviously the process varies between egg and sperm donors, and it also varies between those who donate via a clinic, as all egg donors do, and those who donate outside of one, as some sperm donors do. Um, and the egg donors we interviewed had all done what's called a fresh cycle. So um, they'd been matched with the recipients um, and they'd undergone treatment, which means they were kind of injecting um, hormonal drugs. They were being scanned, they were being monitored at clinic. And at the same time, their recipient was preparing to receive the embryo that would hopefully be created from one of their eggs. So for some egg donors, knowing that they've been matched with a particular person and knowing that their treatment was synchronous, to kind of fuel the sense of connection for them. So one egg donor said, me and interview said, well, when I was doing these injectors into my stomach, it didn't really feel like I'm doing this for a complete stranger anymore. Um, and from our research, there seems to be something quite particular about egg sharing as well. Um, women who did this often thought about themselves as kind of being on a similar journey to each other. Um, and this idea that their eggs would be kind of randomly split seems to be quite compelling. There was a couple of it was more than one donor who kind of referenced the film Sliding Doors and sort of imagined oh, what, 
what if anything would have been different if like the eggs that I gave away were actually the ones that I would have kept and how would that have changed anything. Um, whereas if we think about clinic sperm donation, then treatment is not one to one, it's not synchronous. Uh, donated sperm is frozen and it's not used by recipients until at least six months later. There's usually multiple re recipients from a programme of donation. So those gender differences um, in terms of how strongly or frequently donors expressed a sense of affinity with recipients, well partly we can kind of explain that through those differences in the actual process of donation in clinics. However, <laughs> I would say that that probably is a bit simplistic an explanation on its own. I think there are probably other reasons that we can perhaps discuss um, later why we've seen that pattern in our research. And I think we probably also need to remember that the way we currently do egg and sperm donation is not the only possible way it could be done. And indeed, practices can and have are changing. So we're seeing improvements in cryopreservation, which means there's potentially more frozen egg don donation cycles that are going to happen. Um, and we see that the increasing use of the internet to facilitate known sperm donation. So it's not, these practices are not set in stone by any means. So what next? I said I was going to conclude by thinking about the implications of all this. So we've talked about how some donors experience an affinity with the recipient. Um, it could be deeply emotional, rewarding and intense. Um, it could sometimes be intense and challenging to navigate. Uh, I mean, I've talked a little bit about what kind of shapes those feelings of affinity. And now I want to kind of just conclude by thinking about the kind of so what question. Um, what should change, if anything, as a result of these kinds of findings and experiences? Is there anything we could or should do to perhaps acknowledge, maybe even encourage a pos positive experiences of such affinities? So in this presentation, I'm going to suggest some ways in which this could happen in clinics. Um, and at the very end of the event, as I said, we're going to come back to these and ask you as an audience to vote on whether any of you think any of them are a good idea or not. Now, I should say at this point that we're not really necessarily advocating all of these. Some of them are maybe might be seen as controversial. Some of them will raise new issues, which we'd like to discuss with you. That's really our aim is just to start a discussion about what we think is a kind of under considered aspect of daily conception rather than we're not kind of pitching this as a sort of policy agenda or anything. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to focus on donors who donate in clinics. Um, and so the situation at the moment is that if donors don't already know their recipients, they can't find anything out about them. Recipients, however, can request non-identifying information about their donor. So that's um, that's the information that the donors have recorded in their profile, which is, includes kind of tick box information about their kind of occupation and interests and things, but it also includes the pen portrait they've written about themselves. So it's quite potentially quite extensive. Um, and of course, although they they can't find it any, they can't identify each other, there's of course a prospect that they might one day meet if and when um, a donor keen to person decides who that the recipient try or decides to contact the donor. Um, so one route that we could potentially go down to address these kind of affinities would be to kind of increase opportunities for reciprocity between donors and recipients. So, for example, clinics could perhaps more actively encourage and facilitate the passing of thank you cards, letters or maybe token gifts from recipients to donors, as Rachel experienced. Um, and from our research, we're aware that there's quite a wide variety at the moment in the extent to which this is um, even allowed uh, or encouraged in clinics at the moment. Um, alternatively, or perhaps additionally, donors could be allowed to access non-identifying information about their recipients after their donation. So we found that donors were often really interested to know any little snippet of information about their recipients, especially kind of anything about their backstory and their family setup. Um, and so what we also found was that those who had their own children especially sometimes commented that it seemed a bit unequal that they as a donor provided so much information about themselves and their family but they couldn't find out anything about the recipient and their family and they usually sort of accepted that as the right way if for just them as a donor but if they had their own children they sort of thought well actually I can't tell my child anything else about this other family who may one day be in contact with us. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't finish saying what I wanted to say there. Um, so we could imagine a situation where um, donors could perhaps access some basic information about um, about their recipients, um, maybe similar to um, the, the profiles that um, recipients can access about them. Um, and the final thing I want to say is that we could perhaps also think about uh, ways in which we can enable donors and recipients to start off being unknown to one another to connect or communicate. So perhaps ways in which they can communicate anonymously through a third party, such as the clinic or the HFEA. Uh, and you could imagine the situation where that might lead to um, direct communication. Um, and this would blur what is currently quite a rigid distinction in the clinics between known and unknown donation, which is much less rigid and much more blurred if we kind of look outside of clinics at the moment. But to explain what I mean, um, Basically, I remember one of the ex share donors I interviewed during my PhD saying that it just seemed crazy that she couldn't tell her recipient that her own son had developed a milk intolerance, I think it was. Um, she said it took her ages to figure out what was wrong. You know, it seems a bit crazy that I can't just tell this my recipient that, you know, maybe just watch out for this because it could potentially be a genetic thing. Um, and this woman, in fact, also suggested, why don't we just have a simple tick box on the donor forms say oh I don't mind if they want to contact me and they could have a tick box on their form too to say I don't mind if they want to kind of send a message to me through the clinic either um so that's way one way in which we could imagine um a way in which um, donors and recipients could potentially communicate but as I said uh, I'm going to come back to these um after we've had a chance to discuss to get everyone's um thoughts on them but for now that's um the end of my slot um, thank you very much for listening and I hope that's got you thinking about um, donor and recipient connections. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. That was really thought provoking. So now I want to welcome Yael Elan Clark from the Donor Conception Network to the floor. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your response to Leah's presentation. And I believe you're going to share your screen as well, aren't you? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, that's visible, that's okay. Thank you, okay. All right, H hello, um, I'm Yael, I'm from the Donor Conception Network. Thank you so much for having me at this wonderful event. Um, DC Network is an organization dedicated to offering families with donor conceived children uh, support and resources um, amongst other things. We engage in a number of ways directly with our membership body, uh, over 2,000 families and further afield with the general public in the UK and abroad, offering information, guidance and community. Um, so who are our members? So for some, using donor conception will be after a long journey of infertility. In the case of many heterosexual couples, often a long journey involving grief and loss. For others, donor conception will open a door to parenthood that could not have been achieved in another way in the case of single parents or same-sex couples, um, but also maybe accompanied by unexpected infertility. Our members include people who have used a range of donors, from family donors to known donors, identifiable and anonymous, conceived in the UK and in other countries, and uh, therefore complying to different regulations which affect the amount of information the family might have uh, and can share about a donor. Um, so what do we bring to this talk about donors, seeing that we, our work is predominantly with donation recipients? Um, well, hearing Petra and Leah's work on donors uh, was a really valuable insight for us. Many of us recipient parents um, are, of course, interested in the donor's perspective, who they are, how they feel about their donation, their motivations for this act, uh, and more. When we got a glimpse of the affinity expressed um, in this study at a previous event that Leah and Petra held, we felt it was something that we very much wanted to share with our recipient families, um, to whom this may be particularly pertinent, of course. I think it's also important to note that uh, what I'm presenting today is based on our encounters as a grassroots organization, uh, through our conversations with people, uh, in, in our role as a support organization, and not methodically collected as it is in research. 
Uh, we offer a naturalistic view of the current state of affairs for people directly affected by the issues in this research. And sometimes this may give us a unique insight into the more difficult experiences, um, maybe with people who are willing to come to us for support, but not necessarily willing to subject themselves to the scrutiny of a, in a research context. The recipient donor connection. So although donors and their donations are key to what brings our members together, as you have heard already, recipient families are built in many different ways. Consideration um, in the early stages for who the donor might be can be a really lengthy process uh, when one has control over that decision. Uh, or it can be completely opaque when the matching is done by a clinic. Recipients are not always able to choose their favorite route, um, and that can be because of a limited supply of donors, limited match of, in the pool of donors, um, a sense of, of, of time running out or, or not enough information, limited information. Recipients may be caught up in the roller coaster of emotions around donor choices um, or be rushed into making treatment decisions. And, and sometimes there really just isn't enough of a pause or space to consider um, the long view of their and their future child's connection to this person. There is significant variability in attitudes and availability of information um, amongst our members and amongst um, the wider DC community um, for the purposes of sharing. So where donors are not known, there may be near to no information available, whereas others might have a full medical and biographical picture of them and the prospect of connecting with them in the future. Whilst mo most who tend to reach our doors at the DC network tend to favor openness and talking with their children about their origins, even when they have limited information, uh, or even when they arrive to this later on when their children are a little older, uh, there will be those who may dissociate the donor from the donation. Some people may feel less secure about the boundaries of their family uh, uh, that they are creating in this, and, and when there's a donor involved and may connect less with the entirety of that person, mentally placing them closer or further apart from their own family unit. Although I have no doubt that all our recipient parents will feel grateful for the gift that they've been given, which enables them to become parents in the first place or to extend their family. Um, so thinking about where the donor fits in. So even when there are strong views, um, in the family about the donor's role, um, this may change over time. Either as parents grow in confidence about the route they've taken as their children get older, or as children become more expressive around their own need, needs and desires, desire for uh, information about donors, which may necessitate action from, from the parents to, to on this and even push them to encounter their own feelings on the issues again, which might not always be very easy for them. Um, we often hear from people about how they think about the donor, so recipients, how they might be thinking about the donor, wondering what part of them is present in their own child, in their child, their children. But we also hear the same question from donor conceived people, um, who, uh, young, young sort of young adults or, or, uh, or adults um, who, who have an interest to who also sort of asked that question around, okay, where, where does the donor feature in me? Um, some DC people may have an interest in finding their donor. Some have an interest in learning more information about them and perhaps by extension about themselves. Some will only be interested in other children uh, conceived through their donation, also knows, known as half siblings. And others may have no interest at all in exploring this. And again, this may change over time. We hear of families where the donation story all but disappears, weaving itself into the family story, but not playing much of a part. We also hear how others may wait for their children to grow up and follow, uh, and follow their lead on, on this issue. But there's a growing sense in the network of more families wishing that they had access to more information and even contact with the donor and half siblings earlier on uh, than is currently available to them. Um, 
to bring my presentation to a close, I, I'll end with a couple of examples that we've come across. So the first is uh, this, um, the story of Francis and Caroline. Caroline. Um, they needed to use sperm donation and were able to source sperm from a US sperm bank. When their first child was born, they registered with, um, they joined a US registry uh, to find half siblings to see if, you know, if the donor had donated to other families. They were able to connect, uh, the, these people are based in the UK. They were able to connect with two other families living in the same city in the UK. And all the families who've met um, uh, and who, are all, who, who all have girls are raising the children by the title of sisters. A question that might come up as Caroline and Francis are expecting a, another child so, uh, they, is how they differentiate uh, a sister in their family from the wider sister in the donor related family, from the, from the sisters in the donor related family. So that's quite an interesting. Um, juxtaposition. Um, then I wanted to share Sarah's story and I've got a couple of quotes from her um, which she very beautifully wrote up for our um, uh, members journal. So Sarah is a mother through egg donation with a known donor. Uh, she experienced infertility at a relatively young age um, and, and a, a friend offered to donate eggs. She and her husband have two, two children. Sarah writes, our friend who donated her eggs to me wrote me the most amazing letter whilst I was pregnant about how much she saw my motherly nature and wished to be a parent. I felt this was as important as the donation itself. She said she liked to think of it as giving me a cell, which would be a building block to start my baby. So I, the baby I so dearly wanted. She said that of course she would have more interest in my children than she would have done should she not have gone through this together should we not have gone through this together, but it would be in terms of feeling more connection with them and looking for genetic links between her family and my children. I treasured that letter and have been very lucky in that she and her partner have never wavered in the way they see that, uh, that they see the situation. And then Sarah goes on to say, the biggest hurdle for me since giving birth to two healthy boys is how much I hate the trepidation I feel about seeing our friends and their children. How could the fact that our lovely friends who did the single most generous thing we have experienced also be part of an anxious feeling? It makes me feel so sad that I cannot summon all the gratitude and respect I have for them to overcome this entirely. Um, I'll just hurry up because I'm slightly over time. Um, but life is complicated and feelings uh, can be untangled pra pragmatically, but that doesn't mean that you can then switch them off. Um, and then she goes on to say, uh, um, our friend's children look like and feel like cousins. We are family of sorts and they are genetically related to each other. Um, I'll just end very briefly with a donor day celebration. Um, I attended Fertility Fest, um, which is a arts festival uh, exploring fertility topics a few years ago. And I met, uh, they, they were doing a donor day, which was a lovely celebration for donors. And one of the couples I met there had told me that they actually do that anyway on the day of the donation. They tend to um, celebrate with cake and candles uh, their donors with a special sense of gratitude. So thank you. Thank you, Yale. That was a lovely presentation. And thank you both of you for keeping so well to time. Um, so uh, we now open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, while Yale was talking, I put a couple of links in the, um, in the chat. One of them is for the feedback form. So if you please fill that in, that'd be brilliant. And the other one is uh, an, a link to our website where we have various kinds of resources, for example, leaflets and uh, various sociological fiction stories based on egg donor stories, which are fantastic um, and really lovely. We've had a creative writer write stories, uh, fictionalized stories for us. And look, so all sorts of, of resources are available on the website that I just put in the chat. So. Um, now we uh, do feel free to ask questions in the chat. I believe we are perhaps still waiting for questions to come in. Um, 
we have a question from before the event uh, that I can perhaps um, bring to both Leah and Yale uh, from, um, from a lady, I don't know uh, who she is, but she says uh, that she's worried, uh, she's a parent of uh, an egg donor conceived child and she's worried about the child not seeing her as a mum. Is this a normal concern? And uh, this, I'm guessing, yeah, this is a lot of the kinds of questions that you in DC Network get quite a lot of. So maybe that is one for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, that's a, a, a question that we often get asked and um, it, it's around, you know, the whole adjustment to this whole um, having a, not having a genetic link with um, one's child and then how you yourself process that. And um, we, you know, we, we definitely uh, would invite someone in that situation to explore that with a fertility counselor um, to join us at DC Network, talk to other people uh, about who, who've, who've most definitely um, asked that question, thought about the bonding. Um, in fact, you know, at DC Network, what we what we see is, you know, families are built much like other families, um, and we have, a, you know, a variety of situations, much like the rest of the rest of the families. So, um, I would say that bonding, you know, bonding is a concern very much for for recipient parents when they're thinking about the the donation, and and potentially, you know, sometimes comes in, um, but I would say overall that. You know, it is something that 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 is um, is very much addressed by by how the family grows on to goes on to form relationships, and it, it isn't a a particularly um, we see families bond very much like 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 other families do, um, whether the genetics are there or not. So. I hope that answered. Yeah, the if I if I could add to that in the study that I referred to previously, where we talked about recipient parents as also grandparents, we saw these worries change a lot over time. So when we interviewed, I interviewed parents, we did so. Some of them were very early on in their journey. Others were, you know, that the children by, were ten by the time I interviewed them, and they talked about how these fears had changed over time. And by the time they were changing nappies and having sleepless nights, they, they were very much receding into the background of the everydayness of, of parenthood was, was sort of uh, something that came through in that study with parents, just to add to what Yale was saying there. Um, so we have a few questions now uh, that has come in. So here is one from Karen Fox. Uh, do you think the UK will move towards known donation only, so not just ID release at 18? That's an interesting question. Leah, do you want to have a go at that one? Well, that's a tricky question. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to know what what will happen, but I suppose, I guess it's interesting to think about the kind of logic behind the question. Um, I guess I'm going to have to kind of make some assumptions, but I... I can see where the person asking the question is maybe coming from in the sense that a lot of the debates around, around the law changing were about the children's rights to know their origins or to know their genetic parents, which I think then raises the question about, well, why why is that a, seem to be a rice at 18 and not a rice uh, younger than that? Um, so I think it's a bit of a um, cop out answer I suppose because I, I definitely don't know the answer I my my impression of talking to people is there's not any suggestion that there will there is a move towards to do, do that at all I've not heard that said anywhere um but it's certainly a, pro, a thought provoking thing to think about as to why we why why that isn't on the agenda so much I think it raises a lot more questions um, so we have another question here from Olivia. Uh, I am a recipient but belong to a Facebook group where donor conceived adults believe that the only ethical type of donation is known and willing to be part of the child's life from the beginning. Did you ask the donors in your study if this is something they wanted or would consider? It certainly has implications for future policy. Um, I'm trying to think now. We didn't specifically ask that question. I think, trying to think, we certainly had donors 
who were in that kind of situation where they had they were a known donor and they had perhaps donated to just maybe one or a small number of families with the idea that they would be involved and known to the child from the start. They would always know who their donor was. But I would say that um, I would say that it tended to be led by the recipients. And I think that was probably, we've talked about before, how that's a kind of really common theme in what um, was sort of seen as a fundamental thing about being a good donor was that you kind of take your the recipient's lead on these things. So to the extent that um, donors were invested in that kind of ethic, I think it was kind of led by the people that they were donating to and the way they wanted to raise their children and the way they felt like it was the right way to, to do that. Um, rather than it being their agenda, if you see what I mean, that they were pursuing. I think we also, going back to Leah's talk about affinities, we that the sense of affinity, uh, even amongst the donors who said very clearly that uh, this is a gift, I'm not having anything to do with that, was very much informed in my memory, if my memory serves, serves me right, by the idea that this could get really complicated. If they were known, this could get awfully complicated and they weren't quite willing for that to happen. And so the identity release felt a bit removed and so, OK. Uh, so they were very much informed by the by the notion that, that this was a connection that mattered in some way, but they didn't really want to make it real or live and because that could be too complicated. Um, so that was another sort of aspect of that that came from the study, I think. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here from Anne-Marie Martindale, uh, who's a researcher. What do you see as the key policy implications stemming from your work? Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, that's a big question. Uh, Leah, do you want to have a, have a first go at that one? Um, I, I mean, I think I, I, I've suggested that obviously these specific things that could possibly happen at the end of that talk there in terms of maybe sort of promoting kind of ideas about reciprocity or uh, maybe donors being able to access some information about recipients. But I think probably slightly less specific than that. I think it's probably what I would probably like to happen would be just for people to be talking about this more and to be thinking, I mean, there's a lot more that we can say from the research as a whole, but if we're thinking about this particular aspect of it and this um, sense of affinity that some uh, donors felt with the recipients, just maybe that for that to be more of a prominent discussion and to think more about um, about the implications of that really and how that could be managed and promoted in positive ways, perhaps. Would you want to add anything to that, Petra? <laughs> No, I think, <laughs> I think you've done a good job in answering that. I don't know if Yael would, would want to add anything from the point of view of recipients at this point. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I, I just sort of, I suppose I could add that we are seeing people asking more about, you know, how could I connect, um, how could I find out more earlier on? How could I, um, you know, what are the options for me in terms of making connections with the donor or, 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 or even more so with the, with the half siblings? Um, that being a sort of key interest in terms of people wanting to actually generate these connections and thinking about them. Well, you know, are they part of my wider circle and, and, and is there a possibility of us integrating that earlier so that we don't lose the, the potential of growing that 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 relationship mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know of course that varies a lot and um, it isn't a universal truth so I would say you know there is to, to give people the option would be mm. uh, an incredible um, uh, step mm. I think yeah I think I would agree, agree with that as well I think there's this idea that I, I guess at the minute, if you're going down the clinic route, it's like you you signed up to one situation and there's no way of moving outside of that until the you know the identity relief kicks in or not. And it doesn't really allow allow for kind of just any kind of communication or changing of minds or feelings. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, yeah. sorry, I'd just like to add one more thing that you know we we. 
we always try to think at DC Network about you know what the view of the child might be, and um, and of course children, you know, they might they as I said, you know, they may show a real keen interest as they're growing. They may not. They may show no interest whatsoever. They have their siblings. They're, they're not not interested in you know anything further. But they may well want this other connection um, and and enabling that could potentially, you know, really enrich everybody's life, um, or, albeit, you know, it has to be done carefully and, you know, can also introduce difficulties. Thank you. I think the next question ties in with this, and I think it's a really interesting one from Emma, Emma GL, um, which is, what do we understand from DC adults about whether choices about contact should be the choice of the recipient parent or of the DC child? And she goes on to say, perhaps the underlying question is whether the donor is the recipient's donor or the child's donor. Um, so I think that uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting question in, in really highlighting the embeddedness of family relationships and how we might deal with that. And particularly, of course, when opinions go apart, uh, perhaps. And, and so you might add to that question, what, what do we do, for example, if, if donor-conceived siblings don't want the same thing, then who should be in the driving seat? Um, I don't know if either of you wants to come in on that question. Um, well, I can say this is something that was recently blogged about by, um, by Olivia, actually, our practice consultant, and, you know, just the language also thinking about um, the, the donor um, and whose donation is it? And it's certainly something that was also circulating um, amongst, uh, you know, in, I've definitely seen it pop up as an issue that we've, we've, we've talked about who, who's, you know, whose donor is it? Who, whose information is it to share beyond the family? Um, it, it is a difficult one. And, you know, sometimes there is no, well, often there's no right answer um, and people, um, you know, parents do tend to um, parents do tend to have to make choices about uh, the, their children's lives, and and sometimes this you know this decision about connecting with other people or or might, might be one of those choices that that parents choose to make, um, and sometimes parents choose to to kind of be led by by their by their um, by their children and and wait for them to grow up and be able to make those choices themselves. So, um, yeah. Would you like to add anything to that, Leah? Um, was the question was it about who decides contact? Who decides whether there will be contact? Is it recipients or donor conceived people who get to kind of lead that? I mean, I, again, it's always that thing. I don't have an answer to that question as such, but only to kind of reiterate that I suppose that these were also things, decisions that donors were, if you were a known donor, also something that you were having to think about in your day-to-day um, -day life. So most of the donors we interviewed had, if there were donor, if there were children born from their donations, they tended to be quite young still, at which point um, they would, they would they would tend to be led by the recipient parents in terms of right, how often would they meet up? Would they meet up at all? Would and you know when would that happen? What would they do? But they did envisage a time when this would kind of shift. So they were envisaging, you know, as they get older, it would be you know perhaps more instigated by perhaps the teenagers um, or when they were a bit older. And there was some occasions where there was. Um, with a known donor where there had been a breakdown of a relationship with the recipient um, as well. So then that put the donor in quite a difficult position having to, um, because they wanted to kind of, they felt a moral responsibility to maintain that commitment to being available to the donor conceived person, but also they had made this commitment really to kind of be led by the recipient in this relationship. So there was a kind of, um, very careful kind of balancing that had to be done then. Um, so one story that I can think of in particular where the, the relationship had broken down with the recipient, the donor was continued to kind of send a birthday card, I think, every year. And because she, she had 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 contact with the donor conceived with the whole family when the when the child was younger, but then had broken off and didn't want to be seen as someone who just kind of disappeared for no reason. So the kind of she kind of wanted to maintain that sense of commitment, but at the same time respect 
the recipient parent's decision to kind of disconnect and break that relationship. So there was these were dilemmas for donors as well as as for parents, I suppose. Thank you. Um, so we have we have a, a lot of questions. We've got three more minutes uh, before we enter into the, the stage where we're going to talk a little bit more about policy and we're going to do a bit of polling. And so we have, I'm just going to combine a couple of questions, which is a little bit of a sort of uh, elephant in the room perhaps tonight, which is DNA testing and the way that that is kind of moving up on the scene. Uh, so, for example, we have from Zoe saying, I read a media article that called for all donation to be known donor only as DNA test companies are linking people together, meaning that it will become difficult to be remain anonymous in the future. And Geraldine Morrill also asked about uh, DNA testing um, and how that shapes this field. Uh, what is your comments around DNA testing and, and uh, identity release donation perhaps in particular? Um, I think it, it's certainly a, re a really interesting thick question and a, re a really important one um, and I think there's an argument to say that donors should be kind of made aware, certainly there's an argument that donors when they donate should be made aware that whatever system you're entering into whether you're in, if you're entering this into as an identity release donor or you've entered it into a kind of maybe even if you've entered into it with a known donor relation, uh, relationship whatever the situation is we can't really as a clinic or always say that this is really how it's going to pan out because and you know because of what's happening with DNA sites and it doesn't matter if you don't register because if your brother registers or something you know these connections can be made so I, I suppose um there's an argument for it, be, for it to be made clear to everyone involved that what whatever system official system you've entered into that might necessarily be what it actually pans out to be but whether that means that those there shouldn't be an option to go down the identity release note route at all. I, 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 I'm, I'm less sure. I think those are two different, two different things. Um, do you want to add anything, Petra or Yale? Yale, do you want to add anything to um, that? Yeah, just to say, of course, we're, we're, we're DNA testing is a big topic for, for us, and um, we're coming across. You know, we have many um, donor-conceived adults who are in who find us after they've discovered they, you know, were conceived, um, uh, were donor conceived through DNA testing or families coming to us, um, perhaps because their, their children are about to do um, a, a DNA test. And then we have people who, to, who contact us um, about wanting to connect younger children and, and DNA testing actually being the only way that they can that they can do that. So, or, or to find out more about the, the, the donors um, more than they have. Um, of course, we also have people who, um, who conceive abroad and, and, and may have very different, very different or almost no information about the, the donor. So DNA testing is very much a, 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 a possibility, but uh, I would say most, most people are reluctant and probably for good reason I don't know but to, to put young young children's um, uh, DNA uh, on, on on these websites and also that you know ideally there should be some sort of mediation um, and, and, and management of that connection between recipients and donors that's what we ideally like to see potentially happening earlier um, if, if chosen. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you to everyone for your questions as well. I'm afraid we haven't been able to get through all of them. They're all really interesting. And unfortunately, the evening is drawing a little bit to a close. And we have uh, a few polls that Leah would like to introduce now, I believe. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, can you see the screen, the slide? Yeah, OK. So um, this is a little bit of an experiment. Uh, we've not tried this before, uh, but basically I'm going to um, launch a poll in a bit. It's going to ask you what you think about those three suggestions that I made at the end of the presentation. Um, that 
there, so the three things are the idea that clinics could maybe kind of promote the thank you, giving of thank you cards to donors from recipients, that there could be an uh, option for donors to kind of um, find out a little bit of non-identifying information about recipients after they've donated, uh, and that there could be that tick box so that you could make, um, you could, donors and recipients could opt in to being able to send messages anonymously via a third party to one another. Um, and I guess I'm thinking of this a little bit the same as going to get into a read of the room. Um, if we were all in uh, a meeting together, if it was a normal kind of seminar or conference, then I could probably look around the room and see who was kind of nodding along and who was kind of shaking their head or looking worried. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with this. We're not trying to do some kind of official research about where, what, what we're definitely going to do. That, that's really the purpose of this. And it's anonymous, so I won't know who's, who's voted with what. I'm going to launch the poll now. Uh, give me a second. And, uh, okay, so hopefully you are seeing that now. And so the first question is that what about if what you think about thank you letters? Um, do you think clerks should gently encourage recipients to write a thank you letter and sort of help them out to do that if they want to? If you think that yes, in most, in most circumstances that would be a good idea, vote yes. If you think maybe in some circumstances it would be okay, but definitely not most, or perhaps you think it's not inappropriate, or perhaps you just don't know at all. Uh, the second one is about the idea that you could get non-identifying information about recipients, similar to that which donors uh, can access about recipients. Same kind of answers. And the last one is about uh, whether there should be that tick box on donor and recipient registration forms. I'm just seeing the results come in now, but I'm going to give people a bit longer. I can see about um, approaching half people have voted so far. It's really interesting <laughs> to see everyone's uh, results, so I will share this when, uh, when, when we've done. Uh... Just give me a few more seconds. Would have been interesting to have run the poll at the beginning as well as at the end to see if we'd changed anybody's minds at all. Um, okay, well we're we're running out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the polling now. I apologise if there's the last sort of eight people. If you have uh, if you want to vote now, vote. So I'm ending the polling and I'm going to share the results. Um, so it's quite interesting, as you can see. Um, for the first question about thank you letters, we can see that, you know, that seemed to be quite a popular idea. More than half of you thought that, that in most circumstances that would be a good idea. And that is something that some clinics are doing um, in various ways. Maybe just mention that it's a possibility. Um, and a significant number have think it might not work in quite some, some, some circumstances, maybe some things, times where it's not appropriate. And then some of you not too keen or not sure about that. And then the second question is, I think, oh, actually more, more popular, slightly more popular than um, the idea of thank you letters there, that, um, that donors should be able to access non-identifying information about their recipients after the donation, um, but kind of not similar proportion to the previous questions, I, I suppose. And then the last question, um, it was really popular, actually, the idea of a tick box um, on... Uh, on the forms to be able to um, communicate with each other via a third party. But again, there's, there's, there's people, a slightly smaller minority who are not sure about that. Okay, well, thank you very much for doing that. It was, I know it's a bit of an experiment, um, but very interesting uh, for us certainly to, to hear your, see your responses and I hope that it was interesting for you as well. I'll hand you back to Petra now. <laughs> thank you, Leah. Uh, and thank you everyone for participating. We are, uh, only four minutes away from closing this evening. I've really enjoyed um, your talks, Leah and Yale, and I hope everyone in the audience have too. And thank you everyone for all your really interesting questions. It'd be fascinating to be in the room with you and now go for tea, a cup of tea, and actually talk this through. Obviously, we can't do that because we're online, but on the other hand, I think we have a, a bigger audience than we would have had otherwise, so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Uh, thanks for your questions. As I said in the beginning, do email us if you want to make contact, if you have questions that you think we might have an answer to. You're very, very, do feel free to contact us and 
and get in touch and visit our websites for the resources that we offer as well. And we are still working on those, so there will be more to come. Um, uh, I shall close it there. Thank you very much for coming along and hopefully see you again soon and hope you enjoy the rest of the festival if you go to anything else. Thank you.